if the instructor on your course says that the wound packing is as simple as plugging the hole, leave. Seriously, just exit the room and request a refund. Wound packing seems very easy, but actually it's a complex clinical procedure with many variables and lots of confusing suggestions all over the internet. But don't worry, by the end of this video you will know exactly how to do it. My name is Alex Hepner and this is Groove Call. To understand what wound packing actually is, how it works and how it differs from other methods of hemorrhage control, we need to take a brief look at the pathophysiology of bleeding. I will explore only the most important elements, so if you want to learn more, please read this book. In a healthy person, the pressure inside the blood vessel is slightly greater than the pressure exerted by the surrounding tissues. Trauma reverses this relationship. The pressure inside the vessel will decrease due to the blood outflow and the pressure outside of the vessel will increase due to the bleeding into the surrounding tissues. So effective hemorrhage control means not only plugging the hole, but also managing what's happening outside of the bleeding vessel. And that's precisely when wound packing comes into play. Unlike the direct pressure technique, which compresses only tissues superior to the injured site, or a tourniquet that uses circumferential pressure to completely cut off blood flow to the injured site, wound packing combines two different pressures, digital and multidirectional, to maintain the balance between intra and extra luminal pressure. Just look how cool it looks in practice. First, remember that due to its nature, wound packing is most effective in so-called junctional areas like groin, armpits or neck. Packing torso would be counterproductive as you could not achieve digital pressure. Now make sure that your hemostatic dressing is easily accessible with one hand. There are no set ways of doing this, but army medics I spoke to advise opening the packaging and having it ready in your sleeve or behind your glove, preferably with a small knot on the end. In a moment I will tell you why. Now use any type of gauze to gently remove excess blood from the wound site while trying to preserve any clots that have formed. This is the current pre-hospital trauma life support edition 9 advice, different from old school teaching that suggested almost blindly sweeping the wound to remove excess blood and all the clots. Now it's time to put your finger into the wound to locate the source of active bleeding. Different textbooks say that you should feel a warm, pulsating stream of blood on your fingertip, but if you are wearing thick gloves, you may not feel anything. In this case, and this is uh, practical advice outside of the guidelines, use two or three fingers to blindly block as many vessels as possible. Okay, at the moment you are using so-called digital pressure, stopping the blood outflow and maintaining pressure inside the vessel. Now it's time to tightly pack the gauze into the wound, directly over the most active point of bleeding. There are many techniques you can use to pack the wound, but most important thing is to never ever remove this digital pressure you're maintaining with your finger because blood will flow again. With one finger constantly on the injured vessel, insert the gauze into the wound. See how much easier it is if the gauze is already prepared? Also, note that the knot you just made on the end of the gauze helps maintain digital pressure. Keep feeding the gauze inside the wound, replacing one finger with the another one, making your way back from the wound, making sure all the pressure is directed to where the blood is coming from. Make sure the ghost isn't going to shift or move anywhere else in that wound, causing already formed clots to dislodge. Once the wound is packed above the skin level, maintain pressure on the packing. The length of this depends on the product you're using. If it's just simple plain ghost, PHTLS suggests 10 minutes of continuous pressure. If that's combat ghost, you need to follow the manufacturer's instructions. And this brings me to a very touchy topic. Okay, so uh, here's an unpopular opinion number one. You don't need to have a dedicated hemostatic dressing to perform wound packing. Yes, they all consist some kind of hemostatic agent that promotes clotting and therefore they will stop bleeding faster than normal goes. But there are no proper research papers associating the use of hemostatic gauzes with reduced mortality and morbidity. What we have today though is this study that demonstrates that the effectiveness of hemostatic dressings in comparison with ordinary gauze 
is very similar. Also, if you want to dive deeper and compare different hemostatic dressings, uh, please read uh, this study. Unpopular opinion number two. Instead of a finger, you can use pediatric muggle forceps. Before you will throw something heavy in my direction, let me explain why I think muggle's forceps are an interesting idea. We don't often explore what might be in the wound. To illustrate what I mean, let me use a USB camera. If you are packing a gunshot wound, your finger can come into contact with a bullet or piece of fractured bone, both of which can cause an, a nasty injury. In wounds caused by explosions, you might find shrapnel and in stabbing wounds, broken pieces of knives or even glass. Yes, they take bottles, smash them against the wall and use them as weapons, as we've seen recently uh, in Stoke on Trent when pretty much every night in Warsaw. Just joking. Again, I'm not saying you should not put your finger into the wound. All I suggest is that if you suspect the wound is contaminated with nasty objects, consider using Magiel forceps instead of your finger. Look, this is a trick that was shown to me by one of my students who used to be an army medic in Iraq. You take a gauze, you make a big knot in the end of it and then just pack the wound as normal, just using the forceps as your finger. And yes, Magil forceps have their limitations, like they won't help you find the source of bleeding, but again, they may help you to avoid nasty injuries, so just weigh the risks versus benefits. Now, what do you do if your hemostatic gauze is not sufficient and the dressing is soaked with blood? Well, I've been taught to keep adding gauze on top, but once again, the guidelines are quite clear. If the dressing is not effective because of its soaking, remove it and replace it with a new one. Some people put tunicates on the top of the packed wound, but personally I find it counterproductive due to the lack of the pressure point, like in OIS dressings. Uh, the use of tunicates, which will take your hemorrhage control to the next level, is showcased in my next video. My name is Alex Hepte and this was Group Call.